Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So far we have looked at two uh, lectures one on the relevance of poetry and the other on approaches to poetry. Today we will discuss the topic functions of poetry. It refers to the what question of Simon Sinek. This is about knowing what we do. First question is why, why we do, why we believe certain things. Second question is how how we do certain things that is doing and the third one what, what kind of poetry do we study and here we connect this uh, question of what kind of poetry we study or what kind of poetry people write with the question of knowing what we do and we connect further this with different functions of poetry. For the purpose of this lecture we have identified seven functions of sorry, we have identified 11 functions of poetry. We begin with identity, morality, mystery, communication, entertainment, record, truth, beauty, justice, self and nature. Under these categories we have specific functions we will examine them one after another. The first concept, the first function identity how do we form a sense of identity? We belong to a country, we belong to a geography, we belong to a culture. How do we have this sense of belonging to a country in terms of nation, nationalism, patriotism and the kind of cultural pride that we have? Poetry has this function of building the identity of a nation. So, we have a number of founding stories for each country. And the major founding story for any country is an epic. So, the epics uplift the national pride. In the case of India, we have Mahabharat and explains what it means to have a Bharat that is India. Similarly, we have Homer's Iliad in Greece. In Rome, we have this Virgil's Aeneid and in English, we have Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen. Specifically in the context of 16th century, Spencer wrote this epic The Fairy Queen referring to the Queen Elizabeth I and this Queen Elizabeth indirectly is connected to Britain from Brutus, a Trojan hero who was transformed into Britomart to suit Queen Elizabeth in this epic. These epics are powerful stories once created they float around to give a sense of heritage and identity to the people of the land. Next, we move on to moral function of poems. Morality and ethical value is a key point in literature and we have a specific kind of poems, they are called didactic poems, they have some morals, some poems have implicit morals and these didactic poems have explicit moral values. And these poems address us as moral being and it touches on our moral intelligence. You know we have different kinds of intelligence, emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence, natural intelligence. We have so many and one of the intelligences that we discuss when it comes to poetry or literature is moral intelligence. Naturally, poets who have some kind of belief in God or some kind of uh, concept which is something ideal, something to do with uh, the spiritual aspects or idealistic aspects of human beings, it may have, the poem may have some relation to material life, but how to live this material life with some moral values that is what we have in great poems like Thirukural from Tamil Nadu, India, from the Gita from India. We have such ideas in the Bible. Some of you may know 
that the greatest literature in the western context is the bible. Similarly, for uh, Muslims the Quran is the best literature and when it comes to English literature we have many such poems Wordsworth has a narrative poem called Michael and it deals with the story of a hard working family. The family has a dream of building a sheepfold, but the sheepfold remains unfinished because the son who goes to the city London loses himself in the ways of city life, the corrupt world. So, when you have this comparison between a pure world and a corrupt world, naturally the element of morality comes in. So, the, the poem has a beautiful line like this at the end and never lifted up a single stone. The next concept, the function of poetry that we deal with is religious understanding. We have to understand the fact that there is some sense of mystery in the world and this mysterious sense is connected with some creator, some source of uh, organizing this world into some particular order. So, we have religious poetry or spiritual poetry, spe specifically religious poetry with reference to some religion and in general some spiritual poems we have. These poems deal with God life, death, love and these are the greatest themes in literature, especially in poetry. We have this great epic Dante's The Divine Comedy, it deals with the entire universe, heaven, hell, purgatory and we also have British poet John Donne, he deals with uh, his religious understanding in holy sonnets, these are called terrible sonnets as well and specifically we have one poet from British literature that to metaphysical poetry George Herbert, he has a poem called The Caller, there he deals with the question of being uh, a slave to God, how can an individual have freedom that is the question that he asks, do I have to be a slave of God or somebody, why should I be, I want to have my freedom that is what George Her Herbert says and so at the end when after expressing all his doubts, after his expressing all his uh, struggles, he begins to have some faith. This poem shows the inability to have complete faith and yet having it and the, the poem ends like this. My thoughts I heard one calling child and I replied my lord. The next function of poetry that we look at is communication, poetry by default communicates something to the reader, to the people and when poets write poems, they communicate, when they communicate some message, they also do some kind of innovation experiment with the language that they use. They communicate and also experiment with the language that they use. T. S. Eliot has a wonderful statement on genuine poetry in the context of an essay on Dante, he says, what is surprising about the poetry of Dante is that it is in one sense extremely easy to read. He says genuine poetry can communicate before it is understood. This is a point that we have to take into consideration very seriously when we have some kind of hesitation about poetry. Is poetry easy to understand? Can I read poetry? Can I make sense out of it? Nothing to worry about at all, just imagine. Uh, T. S. Eliot, a great poet writing about another great poet saying genuine poetry can communicate before it is understood. What we deal with in this course is all genuine poetry, you can easily understand them though you may find some obstacles, you will be able to overcome all those ob obstacles as we go through this course. Great poets use the common language of the people and bring life to poetry. In British literature we have Geoffrey Chaucer, he begins his uh, poem the general prologue to the Canterbury Tales like this. When in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root and all, the veins are bathed in liquor of such power and as brings about the engendering of the flower. This is the beginning, this is one of the famous beginnings of any poem in British literature 
particularly about spring. The next function of poetry that we discuss is entertainment. When you read poem, it gives pleasure, it gives some kind of profit, you feel happy about it and psychologically we have a tendency to have our own emotions being relieved from our mind when we enjoy poems. That is why we say that poetry is therapeutic, it is a kind of therapeutic aid, it has a cathartic that is emotional relief effect on the reader. Some poets have said and some readers also have said this poetry is a sanctuary. It is sanctuary, a place of rest for both poets and readers. When we go to sanctuary, what happens is we forget the harsh realities of life. Sometimes we may find poems consoling us we may get wounded by the kind of life that we see in our life. So, we get some kind of comfort from reading poetry. We are also able to make sense of the confusing and chaotic life that we see around us. The Nobel laureate Bob Dylan has a poem blowing in the wind, it is a mind blowing poem. What it says is, when we are determined not to see life with plain open eyes, the answer is blowing in the wind. The answer is there very much in front of all of us, but we are not willing to see. So, he says, the answer my friend is blowing in the wind, the answer is blowing in the wind. We have another function of poetry, it records, it re reflects life as it is. So, it is a kind of mirror we have in literature, especially in poetry. Matthew Arnold said this, poetry is a criticism of life, it is a record of life, then it holds a mirror up to reality despite the critical problem of representation. We may believe that language cannot represent reality as it is, still we are able to see some sense of reality through language and literature particularly poetry. Look at the official documents and records that we have, compare them with the kind of records that we have in poetry, there is a vast difference. One is subjective, official, another is subjective, emotionally felt impression that we have. So, poetry actually bears the soul of people. An interesting poem in this context that we have is uh, the Indian poet Nizim Ezekiel, he has a famous poem Night of the Scorpion. This poem portrays the Indian mother and the Indian culture that we have. A mother is bitten by a scorpion. She says, my mother only said, thank God the scorpion picked on me and spared my children. She is relieved that her children have been spared and she is bitten by the scorpion. She can bear the pain whereas, children may not be able to bear it. Poetry deals with truth. What kind of truth we have in poetry? It may be factual, it may be imaginative, it may be an imaginative representation of a factual truth, but it is a kind of negotiation of truth that every poet has in his or her poetry. So, the question that we have to ask is, is truth subjective or objective? Most uh, narrative, dramatic and lyric poems deal with the truth of life, albeit slantingly partially, incompletely, indirectly. This indirect understanding of truth or indirect representation of truth is what we have in poetry. Political and economic failures or mismanagements may affect a whole society on a large scale. We have this example of COVID-19. The British poet laureate Simon Armitage has recently written a poem on lockdown. It is a comment on what happens during a pandemic. He says, and I could not escape the waking dream of infected fleas in the warp and weft of soggy cloth by the tailor's hearth. We come to one of the greatest functions of poetry. It has some artistic value. It captures the beauty of life, the evanescent beauty of life, the temporal beauty of life the changing flexible life. In this context, we have this concept 
of poetry as a verbal art, an icon, a well wrought, well designed, well constructed icon. This icon uses verbs, words. These are problematic as they are ambiguous, they may have multiple meanings. But then, if poets use words, well, in a structure of feeling, with a structure of value or truth, they can create a beautiful and appealing form in poetry. One of the good examples that we have is John Keats poem, Word on a Grecian Urn. Keats calls art form cold pastoral, but the art he has created in his poem is not exactly cold. It has some life, it goes like this. Beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Another function of poetry that we have to look at is justice. Here and there we find some social protests and some poets write about their own sense of indignation about the kind of injustice they see around them. Our ex existence as you know cannot be easily differentiated from the kind of protests that are going on around us. We may have some individual protests or social protests, some may be visible, some may be invisible, but here and there you will find different forms of protests, particularly in poetry. These are protests against different forms of exploitations, oppressions. Adrian Rich, a feminist poet, has a poem called The Phenomenology of Anger. She feels angry about the patriarchal society that she lives in. So, she expresses her anger against patriarchy. I hate you, I hate the mask you wear, your eyes assuming a depth they do not possess, drawing me into the grotto of your skull. Yet another function of poetry is uh, human affirmation, human self-affirmation. The idea that you write poetry is a kind of affirmation of one's own self in language. Majority of people are disrupted, especially after the disruptive technologies and businesses in the globalized economy. We have some kind of disturbances or other throughout our life throughout centuries. So, how do we overcome them and how do we deal with them? We have some major forms of disturbances through some oppressive forces, racism, sexism, casteism, neo-colonialism, neo-liberalism, anthropocentrism and today globalism. These are all threats to humanity and the planet. We have seen this happening and many poets have expressed their discomfort with these kinds of oppressive forces. Maya Angelou, an American poet, has a poem, Still I Rise. It is a wonderful poem of self-affirmation from the oppressed group of people. You will find it very interesting to watch her reading of this poem on the YouTube. You may write me down a history with your bitter twister lies, you may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust I will rise. We come to one of the major functions of poetry today and it has always been there in the form of pastoral poetry and other concerns right from the beginning of humanity. Today we call it ecological poetry with an ecological awareness. It is not just nature poetry as we have in Wordsworth, we have a specific form of poetry, eco-poetry. Poetry may be composed through craft, artistry. It has always dealt with nature as a major theme in poetry. Some poets have high awareness of nature in contemporary poetry. A well-known example of this eco-poetry is A. R. Ammon's Garbage. Garbage? What do you mean? Do you have a poem on garbage? Yes, we have many poems on garbage and it is not just a poem, it is an epic poem. Epic poem on the kind of garbage mounds that we see in every city wherever you go. Today COVID-19 is a stark reminder for us to protect nature for us and for our posterity. Here is a small example from A. R. Ammon's garbage. He says, 
garbage has to be the poem of our time because garbage is spiritual, believable enough to get our attention, getting in the way, piling up stinking, turning brooks, brownish and it goes. So far, we have looked at various functions of poetry. We began with identity, touching upon patriarchic, patriotic pride, morality concerning ethical value, mystery dealing with religious understanding of life, communication experimenting with language to express ideas very clearly to the audience, entertainment having some therapeutic healing effect on the audience, record showing the real life as it is in society, truth referring to the factual negotiation that poets do through imagination in their poems, beauty having the artistic function of poetry, justice relating to social protests by people in various forms, especially poetry. Self, finally, you will understand all of us have to deal with our own self. What are we, who are we, where are we and how do we deal with the world? And first of all, we must know where we are and what we do, what, what kind of idea that we have about ourselves. Affirmation of our own self is a major function of poetry and lastly, we found nature to be a predominant theme in poetry, particularly in contemporary poetry where ecological problems are addressed for our own welfare. We have some references as usual, please refer to these articles for further understanding of various functions of poetry. Thank you.